Robert's an ex-management accountant who left the corporate world over a decade ago to study for an MA in Western Esotericism. Was that uh, Nicholas Goodrich Clark's one down at... Um, it was, yes. Yeah. yeah. Followed by a PhD which considered the interplay between science, religion, philosophy and the paranormal in the 19th century. He has a lifelong interest in ghosts, UFOs and psychic phenomena. He undertakes independent research in each of these and has presented talks to the Ghost Club, the Last Tuesday Society... And we'll be giving a talk to the London Dowsers later in the year. He's been a council member of the Ghost Club since uh, 2018, is a member of ASAP, the SPR and the UK Paranormal Society. Um, yep. This talk examines how we've been observing strange sites for millennia. Humans, non-humans, angels, fairies, ghosts, spirits, demons, cryptids, monsters, flying objects, non-flying objects, out of time or out of place. In this speculative talk, some of the problems associated with eyewitness testimony and the possible links between some or all of these sightings are considered, whether they're real or not. Might they point to the possibility of the existence of different realms of being? And is apparent travel or contact between these realms accidental or intentional? Are the observers of these phenomena somehow gifted or special, or are they simply deluded or diseased? It's a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Robert Radakovich. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, CJ. Thanks for firstly, thanks for inviting me to, to speak again. Um, and thank you to everyone who's um, who's made the effort to come along today. Um, I'll try and keep it to a, to an hour or so. Uh, those of you who are online and I know some of you know already know me can I can be a bit of a boast. So I will I'll try and uh, limit that to maybe field a few more questions um cj has uh, given you a very a sort of a really good uh, summary of some of the things we're going to talk about um those of you who um uh, recognize the reference in the in the title uh, specifically the magonia will will know of um this is a bit of a not really a, a homage but a bit of a, a reference an oblique reference to Jacques Vallée's work um, from 1969. He has written some more books since then in a similar vein. Um, but what, what Vallée um, did very early on, bearing in mind this was written only 22 years after the sort of Kenneth Arnold iconic uh, UFO sighting, which subsequently led to the Quinning of the term flying saucers, not by him, but um, uh, newspaper reporter afterwards. Um, it's only 22 years after that sort of Mount Rainier sighting. So to be quite so incisive and intuitive at that time, I thought was was remarkable. I first read this oh, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so why Magonia? So really, it, it, it's... What Magonia is, it's it's a it's a magical land um going back, you know, well over a thousand years, referenced by Valet in his book, uh, talking about a cloud realm. So an you know, a, a, an unusual, strange paranormal or supernatural realm where it says felonious sailors were said to have come from. Um it, it relates to um, a treatise against um weather magic at the time so even then there were some you know important paranormal links um why have i chosen that as a, as a sort of a reference point or as an anchor point as it did for valet then and since but the, the the term magonia sort of it provides a sort of a mythological and folkloric allusion to the possibility of paranormal realms with strange entities and quite often strange interactions and it's some of those possible interactions we're going to have a, a, a look at later um 
And something that a um, colleague in the Ghost Club, Alan Murdy, has you know said to me once, I think we were in the middle of Trent Park walking to Camlet Moat and we were having a chat about something. He said, people see, still see strange things. We have done for millennia, but people are still seeing things now. We don't understand what they are, and anyone who pretends to fully do so, I, I, I would, I would argue, doesn't really understand the field. But it doesn't mean that we we can't try and push those those boundaries. So some of the links that Valet spoke about between the the mythology and and folklore, and he compared to contemporary uh, observations of of his time. I'm going to have a look at, you know, uh, similar things today and hopefully push that on a little bit forward. Um, I'm not trying to posit or promote any particular perspective. In fact, I'm going to probably knock down a lot more than I, uh, I, I present. But I think it's important as ASAP looks at anomalous phenomena in a scientific way. I think that's got to underpin what I and hopefully underpin what I'm going to talk about this evening. Okay, so just briefly, again, just to clarify what this talk is and is not. Um, where does it come from? Um, I, with 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 some others, just constantly doing sort of research on various things and from a mixture of a cultural, historical and sociological perspective, looking at specifically at people's observations of anomalous phenomena. Um, and trying to see, are there any links there? What What is it they might be seeing? Not to prove the existence of, of anything, but just to see if there's some commonality, something that, that links these things. And as CJ alluded to earlier, and I will come back to later, um, there's there can be, what we might see is there, there's a concentration of observation sometimes around people, but also around places, around locations um which can can be interesting again this research is at initial stage so i said i'm not going to posit any particular theories but the idea hopefully is that i'm going to try and stimulate some thoughts and and and, and you know some discussion and, and and ideas um most of what i'm going to present today is probably not going to be new but some of the interconnectedness and links um, may or may not be. Um, as I said, there's going to be a crossover, even when I will later on delineate between certain things to aid thinking about things and aid discussion. Um, there's a crossover, even with my, my own delineation, but, you know, with certain theories that people might think, ah, it's ancient astronaut or it's extraterrestrial or it's stone tape theory or something um actually i i'm not positing any of those um so not our crazy head friends the ancient aliens and certainly not extraterrestrial hypothesis not to say i don't i'm not a believer but it it doesn't matter for the purposes of these and um it may very well be the answer to everything but I think what I'm hoping to show is actually, I think things are a little bit wider. One of the first things, and, 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 and CJ mentioned it earlier in the intro, that's really important. We're talking about observations by people. And so the to, to not consider some of the pitfalls of eyewitness testimony would be rather remiss as, um, you know, scientific researchers. Um, you notice in the top right hand corner there's a, there's a little um um little picture i put together in about 2 minutes in in in, in photoshop uh one is a is a an american stealth bomber and one is a now becoming classic ufo triangle shape um i'm not saying that they're the same thing but i'm saying that it can it's very easy to see how similar things similar shaped things in the middle of the night with strange lighting can easily be conflated and misconstrued and, and we'll have a look at that 
Okay, so some questions to, to ask, not of only of the observers, but if you observe things yourself. And a lot of people who are here today, I should imagine, are interested in the field, some of you, because of things that you may have observed as a child or since. And you want to just try and find out a little bit more on in natural human nature is to try and explain things. First question here is, are, are the observers really seeing what they are reporting? be great to be able to answer that uh, conclusively but what we can do is we can say that unless somebody unless there's a hoax being perpetrated then the observers probably believe they are observing what they think they're observing and that's important because it's not a question here necessarily of what's being observed but the perception of it um for all of us and when i presented this before and actually i noticed somebody who's um who's who's with us today when i presented this i think last time to the ghost club and i asked this question um and somebody sort of interestingly challenged me on it and it works both ways so there are a number of factors which need to be considered so pre-existing beliefs our knowledge which in this environment is probably going to be higher or certainly much higher than um, a, a lay person talking about paranormal phenomena, cultural influences, uh, books, TV, film, etc. And these things cannot cannot be dismissed, and they do influence us whether we think they do or not. Um, I would suggest. And so, the question I ask is: Would a ghost sighting by an ASAP ghost club or SPR member? be more valid than that of a non-member. Non and you could argue both ways that it would be more valid because we have greater knowledge and so we're maybe more able to dismiss um, things that it could be misconstrued for. But also, we, we, we also probably hire, have pre-existing beliefs that might be difficult to, to get around. Um, but certainly, when you're looking at accounts of observations of ostensibly anomalous phenomena. Just what's the context? What's the cultural context um, of that person or the location or both? I want to give you a couple of um, uh, examples uh, slightly closer to, to home for me, uh, just to give you an idea of how these things can be affected. And these aren't both uh, to do with paranormal things, but actually um, they both relate quite quite well. A friend of mine is a senior lecturer um, of psychology and actually her speciality is eyewitness testimony. And soon after the uh, the, the, the Yugoslav war, which broke the uh, my, my heritage was Croatian. So even though I was born here, um, the soon after the Yugoslavian uh, war, when it was broken up into the constituent sort of states of Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia and Macedonia, etc. Um, obviously, there were some war crimes that went on, and and my my friend went travelled over to to uh, Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, to to sort of as part of her research to to investigate whether the people on the juries, based on their own um, ethnicity and based on their perceived ethnicity of the um those people in the dock whether it affected some of their choices and unsurprisingly it did um but it was quite nuanced so you or i might not be able to tell the difference between whether somebody was uh bosnian or serbian but a croatian person in the in the jury probably would have been able to and it was found that the you know to cut a long story short it, it was it was found that the the person's ethnicity and their perception of the defendant's ethnicity had an effect on, in a negative way, on whether they were found guilty or not. Second, um, second little anecdote: something that happened to me. I was uh, two or three years ago now. I was in a in a, a taxi cab going somewhere, and I, I don't know why, but the 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 chap started the driver started talking to me about aliens. Now, I had not said anything. Maybe I was projecting um, something uh, about myself. Um, but it was quite strange that he started talking about this and very quickly was saying, oh, you know, 
you can't you can't believe in aliens there's 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 no evidence etc um and have to say where where i live in the uh, north london it's uh, it's now got a very high sort of um uh, greek and turkish cypriot um population so it's quite a religious um sort of eastern orthodox sort of um um populace uh, quite a high proportion and there you know there were rosary beads hanging from um from the the rear view mirror so I, you know, I ascertained that this was you know, nothing, nothing unusual. And then I engaged in a little bit of conversation without trying to, now, not that I'm an expert on UFOs, but but the, the guy then started talking about angels and saying, oh, but of course you must believe in angels. And then I did say to him, okay, well, so compare the evidence to extraterrestrials, aliens and angels. And of course, it's the same. It's either virtually nothing for both, or it's it's similar for both. But it was strange that so his his context, his religious upbringing, clearly, very obviously uh, shaped his thinking. So I know that's a bit of a a sledgehammer example, but it's something that happened to me. Um, okay, so despite all these things, something that that Valet and myself and many others have written about. Um, there are similarities in observation of seemingly anomalous phenomena across time periods, different geographical areas, uh, different cultures and the, the subdivisions within that. And so one might argue that the, the commonalities and the similarities might, and I stress the might, suggest some um, objective validity to those observations doesn't mean that the validity means that they're paranormal but it means that the, the, the observers have definitely seen something um, whether it's paranormal or not okay so just a little little sort of um not even an overview, very, very, very far from exclusive, but just a little look at some of the observations that 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 people have seen in the past, have seen now. Some of these, a lot of these are, are visual, but a lot of these, you know, can be audio as well. Um, but what we'll see is, and... I, I haven't wanted to force the the interconnectedness, but I've had to group this in certain ways. Um, first thing I want to have a look at, and I'm not suggesting these are one and the same, even though Valet went quite a long way down this road. So look at angels, fairies, demons, and aliens. Now, remember, in all of this, there's a lot of crossover, and you'll see a lot of aliens, actually. Um probably because they're quite contemporary to, to our own culture. So uh, a, a typical sort of sensationalized fairy. Um, I'll try and point out things that are similar and, and also distinct from each other. And again, hopefully you'll start to see some of the cultural inputs to that. One of the first things to say is um, that the presence of wings. And I think that's this is this is a, a twofold thing which we'll I'll, I'll go on to. Um, and then we have um, a biblical depiction of um, one of the orders of angels. Um, not sure which one this is. It, it might be the seraphim. Um, and you notice that fairy's got four wings. This has got six wings. If you have a look at uh, the the literal biblical descriptions of the orders of angels uh, they nearly always have more than four or six six wings which is quite interesting um, it's sort of a almost too many really here is a group of I think the nine orders of um, angels um, so what I want to draw your attention to uh, actually that must have been the cherubim actually this this one here um, I've got a larger um, picture of this later, but if if it's still too small on your screen and some of you will be on your phones, what I really urge you to do 
and it's easily found online. Just Google search something like um, biblical or exact biblical descriptions of angels. Uh, and it's really interesting. And what you'll find is there's some very talented artists who have drawn and painted um, versions of this based on the literal uh, translations. And so what I want to draw your attention to here is Thrones, which is almost, uh, as we'll see a little bit later, um, more mechanical than it, than it is um, at all biological. Um, then we have um, a description, a, a, an impression of some sort of demon. Now you see that we, we, we're starting to lose the wings, but we're getting horns. We're also getting a tail. Um, so it's interesting to see both geographically and culturally where, where these limits are. I've introduced here, very familiar to all of you, hopefully, is the, the idea of a grey alien. I'm not suggesting that these are one and the same thing by any means, but there are similarities in in, in posture and in stature um, to some description, even down to the the, the elongated fingers of, of the hands. Um, going back to some more biblical angels here, and again, um, a lot of wings involved. We're not only talking about entities here, but we're also, and we'll see a little bit later, talking about potentially um, machines and, 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 and craft. I mean, UFOs at their basest interpretation are, are, are flying objects. Um, and it does sort of rather beg the question that actually a lot of the um, entities and phenomena that are, are seen um, are, you know, are related to flight. I think this is from um, one of the, the grimoires, I think King Solomon's grimoire. It's, it's um, you know, a, a, a demon from there. Again, wings, horns, and a tail. Also, interestingly, I mean, this one is, is it, despite that, is, is humanoid. Uh, a lot of the demons found within grimoires, occult grimoires, are, are actually just completely animalistic. Uh, often hybrids, uh, which, which is interesting. Now, whether that's to do with based on observation or they're made up, or it's actually to do with the characteristics, there's a lot of birds uh, with that are found within grimoires. So the suggestion of flight and wings again is is apparent. Again, uh, having a little look at the um, this isn't this isn't my picture I've put together, but it but it, it neatly. Um, shows some of the um, um, most common, not not exclusively, not all of them, but some of the most common extraterrestrial sort of groupings. So you've obviously got the, um, the moving left to right, you've got the typical grey, um, then you've got what might be termed an insectoid, then a, a reptiloid, um, a Nordic, and then the one on the far right, either an aquatic or an amphibian. Um, so you have these groups of entities when you actually have contact, not just observation, um, that are most reported. You have many that are completely non-humanoid as well. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting. It was quite a nice little little diagram. So again, and as as with this slide and the next few this isn't an exhaustive list of things it's just to give you a a flavor if we now move on to uh, very loosely ghosts and spirits and again and all of these could have crossovers before and after um this is quite a you know famous sort of ancient greek depiction of a of a ghost, and interestingly, the um, the depiction has um, has got chains, which you know, sit, you know, sort of embellished upon by Dickens, uh, obviously with Jacob Marley in in a Christmas Carol, and for some has become sort of quite iconic. The main reason for that is, but certainly within um, Greek ancient Greek culture, but a lot of a lot of other ancient cultures. The, the reason that a ghost might ever manifest 
uh, or be created, whatever that means, is due to um, a, a tormented spirit um, during life and somebody possibly who also hasn't had proper burial rights. So there is this element of, of um, being trapped and, and, and tied up. Now, some of these photos you'll be you'll be um, very aware of um, these iconic ghost photos. But um, if anyone's more interested, I'll, I'll talk about them um, later if I can. Um, um, again, this has been this 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 one has been poo pooed a lot. This this is quite a recent one from a mobile phone taking in a stately home, and you can see this strange elongated ahead here uh very quickly uh with with almost no analysis you can see that this has been taken on a a, a mobile phone where the, the 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 camera software maybe with a slightly long exposure or strange lighting or whatever reason has just um not correctly focused in on certain parts and where there's been a bit of movement has elongated um the picture I will talk a little bit about photography in a second, but I just thought I'd show you all these. Um, this is probably as good a place as any um, to talk about photography and the problems with uh, the famous Raynham Hall um, ghost, which has had a lot of commentary about it. Um, Hampton Court Palace is still taken from video. Um, a couple of years ago, the Ghost Club had a speaker at uh, Christmas, who was actually a guide at Hampton Court Palace, and um, he spoke about the door here, the end of that corridor being um, being well known to all the, the lot of the people who work there as, as as quite strange. Something that we we we're very much uh, guilty of in the West, uh, most of us, um, is being very West Western centric, talking about. UK, American, European ghosts, but I, I would urge all of you to to look into the very dense, rich mythology of, of the East. This is a depiction of a, of a Japanese uh, spirit or ghost. Um, and it's interesting actually to, to, to look at the similarities and the differences, um, not only of ghosts, but of other entities, um, supposed observed entities across across the continents again just this is a just a, a, a standard bog standard shadow we we very rarely do you know do people see full body apparitions more often than not there's a strange light or there's a strange shadow um but the either the, the the location or the feeling or both suggests to the observer that something was anomalous. Okay, I'll just run through these. Okay, um, so we've got nature spirits, uh, Bigfoot, chupacabras, werewolves. Um, don't need really much introduction. Um, interestingly, when I was putting this together, when I first uh, presented this, um i noticed how many of the uh the the files that i was sourcing were actually uh or the, the the stature and the posture of the of the entities was was very similar um i don't suggest that to create um um any link that is not there but i just found it quite synchronous so you'll recognize this third one as the the, the sort of one of the early original um, uh, footage of of uh, Bigfoot, which is still probably talked about uh, more than some of the more, more recent ones. Here we have an artist's impression of a chupacabra. Um, we, have some, we have some spikes there, um, which uh, often forgotten, red eyes. Um, another, which has similarities, um, and then I finally a typical lycanthrope werewolf again, but actually sort of similar as we have these long arms. We tend to, we the chupacabras are are not always furry, but they sometimes are. We have tails here for some, but not not for others. 
Um, and even in the primate world, the difference between having a tail and not between apes and monkeys is, is you know, it's quite significant. Okay, then we have, um, and I mentioned earlier that it's not just entities, but it's flying machines. Now, I'll, I'll show you them and then, then talk a bit about it. And actually, I have forgotten to talk about photography, but I'll talk about that after, after this. Um, so here we have some Mesoamerican, Southern American, Central American sort of um, bird mythologies and folklore and flying machine mythology. Here we have some depictions some drawings and carvings from the 1890s um, airship flap in the eastern United States. So you can see some pro propellers there, for example. Uh, and some more of those. It was quite interesting. I'll talk a little bit more about that, that later. And I think it's important here to, 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 to reiterate the context. Um, we could assume, let's assume that for the sake of argument, that these are all extraterrestrial flying craft. But the ancient uh, Americans would maybe have seen these as a large bird because they knew that birds fly. Um, the late 19th century um, North American observers might have started to understand a little bit about flight, even though this was observed before the first recorded powered flight. This is what I was speaking about before. This is actually a very, very particular, uh, accurate description of what the Bible suggests is an example of the order of thrones, the angelic order of thrones. Um, interlink interlinked, rotating, metallic bands uh, interspersed with eyes um, and flying, obviously. So it's not a chariot a la um, von Daniken, um, but it's not an, an entity as, uh, uh, you know, a, a humanoid that we might perceive. There's another angelic form again. I think this might be another cherubim, but very stylized. Again, looking slightly further to the east, and if you look at the um, the Vedic texts and the Vimanas that were described there, these very large flying machines, this is an artist description, contemporary artist description. And you can see it's, it's almost like a, a floating city. Um, they're very interesting. If you've never read the Vedic text, the, 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 some of the um, some of the descriptions of both the craft and what they 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 were capable of in terms of their weaponry is 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 remarkable. And if we have a now more contemporary description of Vamana of the time, so um, again, not too different, more like a a, a very large. Um, house um you know eastern house but again a large flying object if we look a little bit more closely i'm not going to absolutely not going to go through these but just to give you an idea of some of the classification that's taken place classification i think is important for for from if you're looking at things from a scientific perspective but it's easy to to, to get hit up on on these things and some of these are so similar to each other. Um, and given that in the last maybe 10, 15 years, there have been two or three shapes that have become uh, more prevalent, certainly recorded. And here's another sort of a, a, a different version of something similar. Obviously, we see a lot of triangles. We see a lot I'm seeing a lot of descriptions of, of craft that are, they're top heavy, not necessarily in terms of their the, the, uh, center of gravity, but they're sort of bigger on top than they are down below. So maybe something like, um, um, where are we? The, the F-28, even here. Um, I liken them sometimes to like the, 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 
the things that old elephants in circuses used to stand on, but actually flipped up on its head at a sort of 180 degrees. Obviously, cigars are still very popular, and we've got these these tic tac things that have been reported recently um, are are quite. And this is as opposed to the just merely lights. Um, let me just go back to there before I before I move on. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about photography. All the all the things that we've we've seen. So whether it's entities, craft, um, cryptids, etc. Ideally, what would be, apart from just the observation, what we'd like to be able to do is photograph them. And in here, as well as with eyewitness testimony, um, I want to just talk very briefly about some of the things that is worth remembering with photography. So, and then especially with things like, you know, ghosts and, and, and UFOs. Um, I'm going to talk about both film and digital. And obviously with, with, with film, you have the potential issue of, of double exposure. Um, so, and that's fairly obvious where you have two different scenes that are overlaid onto the same piece of film. This is almost impossible, not really possible, and a digital format, but you can create the idea of double exposure in, um, you know, in, in post production, post editing. But the very nature of doing that, I, if if something was was truly there, then it wouldn't be it wouldn't really succumb to double exposure. You know, in one hand, um, both film and digital um, uh, photography. Um, or you, you have issues maybe where you have long exposures. So if you have a particularly long exposure of a still scene with a with a small aperture, not letting a huge amount of light in, and somebody walks across the scene, you may see some faint trail of that uh, of that that person or that entity or whatever, and it would look very ethereal and, and strange. Um, the issue with a long exposure is as you're letting more light in you it's easy to get overexposure so it, it's just to highlight some of the, the issues now obviously in the age we're in everyone's carrying quite a powerful photographic uh, equipment with them are quite often in the nature of new mobile phones now there's some good things and bad things about mobile phones if anyone is um um uh, anyone here is an expert in photography or, or just you know uh, uh, a bit more than knowledgeable um, if you haven't already could you just mute yourselves please thank you if you've come in late i'm getting a little bit of feedback um mobile phones do have for this are very good quality lenses for their size but they are very small um and also you have quite often you have a very high pixel count um on mobile phones, which in the first instance sounds great, but it's crammed into a, a very small sensor. And so this combination of having a very small lens um, doesn't let in as much light, not even nearly as much as the smallest um, compact camera, uh, digital camera or, or film camera that you know, has a sort of a normal size lens. Um, what is probably the most impressive ab about the mobile phone photography is, is actually the software, which, you know, can create great effects from portraiture to landscape uh, very easily going between uh, but the two. But um, for, I'd say, proper photography, the way you might want to enlarge the photo, uh, the picture, um, probably best avoided. But they're you know easy they're they're always to hand so there is an a, an advantage there okay just conscious of the time okay so if not et then what so i'm just trying to say okay what we've had a look at all the different types of things that are potentially seen and what i want to do is just quickly run through um 
some ideas. Now, this isn't some theory I'm positing. This is just a, a construction in order to discuss possible um, observations. And what we have here is the, uh, a range of observations from non-paranormal, so clearly not paranormal, definitively so, to things that are anomalous, that might be. Um, for for you for the right hand side to exist, there must be uh, an acceptance that some things are currently inexplicable. Okay, what I want to do is focus now on this left hand side, where things are non paranormal, and you can see there I've got some little categories. And again, this isn't trying to explain all the observations; it's just trying to give a flavour to 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 the things that one might want to consider. You've got the idea of a hoax. We all know, hopefully, what that ho a hoax is. Things could be have a pathological um, um, source. There could be pathology within the observer. They could be merely delusional. Or there could be a cultural misidentification. So, and my, my contention here is that if something is definitively non-paranormal, Every observation should be um, explicable by by one of these things. And it's also, given that it's uh, non-paranormal, it's also suggested with a physicalist perspective. So what do I mean by that? We look at the ASAP and, and, and other people look at things from a scientific perspective, which is predominantly physicalist based. But... If you look at the early paranormal theories and more about my speciality in the late Victorian, they were open to the immaterial as well. Um, but in this non-paranormal world, that's that's not really a factor. Um, so the idea of science on one hand being um, a thing which is... Um, um, at a physicalist perspective of the universe, but it's also a process. So I don't think I would ever knock the scientific method as a process for investigation. Um, but the belief that the science is the be all and end all of everything um, is also a blind faith, which some call scientism. Um, so it's just been worth bearing in mind. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So a pathological source could be the physical medical effects of somebody having epilepsy, a brain tumour, some other disease or trauma. So you see something, but actually your 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 what what you're seeing is some sort of hallucination or or such like brought upon by um, some serious malady. Slightly different to being delusional, where you might have a psychiatric or a psychological input. So it could be a diagnosable diagnosable psychosis in which case a psychiatrist would get involved but it could be a, a stress or fatigue related thing so it could be um a temporary um one harps back to the sort of crisis apparitions um that was so talked about in the 19th century um and again what it is suggestive of if is a is a potential change in the consciousness of the individual brought on by one of these things and lastly in this section cultural misidentification so what, I, what do i mean by that you have a photograph or you're in a location and you see what you think and some people call an orb but it's actually a, a it's dust moat or it's an insect moving catching the light something like that so why i'm calling it misidentification because at some stage we, we, we presume that we can identify it as non-paranormal. You think you're seeing a ghost, but it's a mobile phone lens aberration, as I've described. You know, the, the software can be tricked, but it's also remarkably useful. Well, you're just seeing a shadow. Um, there's movement, especially if in, in some of the investigations where you uh, where the lights are dimmed, it accentuates sometimes um, the effect of any lights that are there. Again, just, just examples off the top of my head. You, you think you've seen a Bigfoot, but you've seen a bear. I think you've seen Nessie, but it's a large eel. And alluding to my you know, 
constructed photo picture earlier. You think you're seeing a UFO, but it's just a stealth aircraft, possibly. So just to reiterate, this is where things are definitively not paranormal. But you think you're seeing something or somebody does. What might be the causes of that? Now moving on to the same the same scale, but I want to now focus on the possibly paranormal. So the idea here is that we cannot prove that it's not paranormal, um, but there are still things to consider and issues. Um, what we're including here are things that are both immaterial and material. So very important concept to, to embrace the immaterial nature of things from an observational perspective. And we'll see that sometimes when people are seeing things, they may look solid, but actually you know that they're not physically there. Does that mean they, they don't exist at all? Or they are just, um, their their structure is immaterial, or are they existing in a different realm that that is not our own? So, and I put, even if some or all of the paranormal phenomena that are observed are real, we don't understand their nature. So we're gonna, we're gonna have overlap all over the place. And where this manifests itself is, now bearing in mind here, I'm not saying any of this is real or true, but it's just to give you an idea to think. So you think you're seeing an alien, maybe typically a gray alien, but it might be a fairy or a wood spirit or vice versa. You might think you're seeing a, an alien, gray alien or reptilian or something, but you might be seeing a future human that is time traveling which you might suggest then that UFOs are time machines rather than, um, you know, interstellar craft. Who knows? You might see what you think is a ghost, but is it actually a bona fide angel? Now, you can't prove any of this at the moment. Or it could be a demon or it could be a fairy. We've already seen there are similarities there with or without tails, probably with wings, sometimes with horns. But this is different from the misidentification we saw in the non-paranormal realm. This is now misinterpretation. The reason is you think you're seeing something apparent, something paranormal. We're assuming for the sake of argument that you are, but you're misinterpreting it because of your own cultural um, sort of proclivities. Then move on to things that are immaterial. So you might be seeing a ghost, and in conventional terms, that might be the spirit of a dead person. But you might also be seeing actually an apparition of somebody who is still alive. Um, again, I hark back to the, the crisis apparitions where people are in trouble and then other people across the globe would see um, um, see apparitions of this person um, in, in some sort of trauma or stress. So it's not all about death, but there is quite a lot there. Again, you could, there's a crossover here, you could be seeing the humanoid form of a fairy. Just because they're drawn with wings, it doesn't mean they may or may not have. Um, uh, an angel as described in the Bible or other uh, religious texts. Or a demon as favoured sometimes biblically, biblically, sometimes in, in, in occult circles, or, or the idea of a nature spirit, something like a, a bogart or a goblin, um, or even a, a harpy, something something like that. Um, and why they're in this immaterial group? Because could, could you actually reach out and touch them? I'm assuming here, if for, for purposes of this construction, no. But then it moves us on to some things where we might see any of the, th the, the observations we've seen before, an alien, a UFO, a future human, an interdimensional human or non-human, any of some of the cryptids we saw, again, or some of the more spiritualist fairy, angel or demons. But actually, they're, 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 they have a material form within our current physical universe so that if they were stood next to you, you could touch them or you could photograph them, for example. So there's a distinction there. I'm not saying there isn't necessarily an overlap. And the reason is we don't know whether what observers are seeing is immaterial, material, or actually all the way back to non-paranormal at all. And even if it is paranormal, 
and we we get to a stage where we can prove that i'm not saying that that would be um unnatural actually it would then become a a normal natural thing just become explicable okay so where does this leave us if if the observations that people are seeing if we if we allow ourselves to presume that there's a veracity there's a there's a reality there and i'm not suggesting by any means that that we should but when we can't explain things we can't ex we have to allow for a possibility the fact that we don't think see these things constantly all the time everywhere suggests that if they are real to whatever that whatever that means then most of the time, the vast majority of the time, either we are unable to see them, maybe because of our state of consciousness, or they're residing somewhere else, be it a spiritual realm, a different, inter a different dimension, even a different time. And if that's the case, then we have to allow for some sort of travel. Now, travel is a very loaded term. And I don't here mean just the concept of physical travel from A to B. That's one option. Um, but we need to um, be, be cognizant of Oh, excuse me, that actually some of the possibilities are are either spiritual or certainly material or might just be the movement of the transfer of information. So again, just to reiterate, so we could have all these um, um, different possibilities, and I'm sure there are many more. And when we find out the truth of things in, in a couple of million years' time, We'll find out it's, a, it's it's yet another thing, but with our sort of current thinking, and you you might recognise some of the the references here, H.G. Wells's Time Machine, etc. So let's now consider firstly immaterial, then material things. So if we have immaterial entities or realms, maybe the observations are just a transfer of information. So what do I mean by that? So let's say that for whatever reason, and it could be, and a lot of you will know this as well as I do, a lot of the theories relate to being in a different state of consciousness. We alluded to the fact that you could be in a state of trauma, but you could be under hypnosis. Um, you might have taken some drugs or alcohol, or you could be stressed. Um, you could be in, in, in a medically induced um, different state of consciousness. Um, that allows you to see into or have access to these different realms if they exist. Even on that basis, what you're observing might just be simply that. It's, it's a facsimile of something. It's an observation. You still physically can't touch what's there. You're just getting into a glimpse either through an often used term, this veil being drawn back, or or you actually being within having greater access to that realm but you're not actually physically there and so the information i'm talking about is is just the light you know the the, the 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 your vision the apparition that you're seeing doesn't mean to say it's not real but you it's not something that you can touch um it might be so an example would be Let's say humans have a soul and when you die, uh, your soul goes to something like a heaven. It's a very bog standard, very Christian centric perspective. Um, but to do that, you have to die. So if you can have communication or transfer inf information between entities that exist in that, that spiritual realm and you're not dead, you, you're by very definition, you're not there. You're just observing something. Okay, so I've spoken about this before. So at times of death, 
and or crisis, one might see an apparition um, or get some information um, audibly. Um, so it's it's indicative of apparent telepathic communication. So on one level, you could say that telepathy or communing with the dead uh, could be traveling to a different realm. I've mentioned things like trance, astral projection. If you were if you attended Dr. Kate Cheryl's very good talk on aspects of mediumship and spiritualism last week at last week's webinar, um, you can see how important um, mediumship or the idea of it is was important in the nineteenth century, but it's still important now. It's that con communing with the dead wherever they are, and also the idea of possession. Uh, this leads me on to something I perhaps should have mentioned earlier when looking at things from a perspective. Frederick Myers, who's one of the founders of the SPR and the coiner of, I think, the uh, hypnagogic as, as a phrase, um, early psychologist, but actually was a classicist. When he was doing his research uh, in, in, into ghost cases and mediumship and the like, he came to the conclusion that the idea of possession by an um, by a, a incorporeal entity of a, of a human body, actually was was of greater proof to him than nearly anything, and the reason was that the transfer of information that was provided potentially provided that the sitter could have now access to, um, you know, and where you know if that could be proved. Now for him, that was unpalatable, but he couldn't get away from it, so he still stated it. And so something I did want to say earlier, but I, I sort of skipped it, was that with all these observations and all the uh, evidence gathering that, that that's done, you should never really dismiss any 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 evidence just because the conclusions of it are unpalatable. Um, by the very same token, you shouldn't take anything on face value uh, just on face value because you know they could easily feed into your own um, pre-existing ideas. Lastly, in this immaterial section, I just wanted to throw a few things in there, and I could probably throw tarot cards in there as well. So I've got Ouija board, invocation, so that would be like an occultist, demonic invocation, uh, and prayer, so standard religious prayer. And I, I, I quite often put these things together, because if you believe in the interconnectedness of the, the, of, of the entities we're seeing, and all the craft, and that if something paranormal existed, um, they've all got to be part of one universe. They're not, they're not distinct in that way. Then actually, all these different things here, Ouija board, invocation, prayer, are just ways of tapping into into that. Not necessarily from a divinatory perspective, but certainly from a from a almost like a spell casting perspective. And I know a lot of people will, you know, will find that sort of quite contentious, which is absolutely fine because there's no proof of that. Now, however, if we move on to um, the, the the material entities or realms that we spoke about, and again, this this whole thing is assuming that there are some things that are potentially paranormal. So, what we're talking about here is actual physical travel um, from A to B. So. We could have these entities actually could just be coexisting with us on, let's say, the Earth. And and when we have access to them, what they're actually doing or what we're doing is crossing through um, from one dimension into another. Depending on what time of the day it is, depending on what time of the week it is, what year it is, the number of supposed dimensions, even with our own physical universe that physicists posit is is anywhere between a three and 67, I think, at the last count. It's probably more as, I, as I'm speaking. So it's a, it's a very difficult area to, to pin down. But we're talking about uh, really a travel through a veil rather than a long distance. Could be a time machine. More and more, I've, I've, uh, if anyone's interested, I think it's Dr. Dr. Masters, I've just got the book behind me, has written a, a, a book about his contention is that UFOs are actually future humans. And this is becoming, you know, quite, quite popular. And there's probably a number of you that know a lot more about it than I do. But what it means is that 
what we think of as as some people think of as extraterrestrial craft if they are actually seeing something bearing in mind i'm not saying that anyone's ever seen anything for, for, that you can prove that actually it could be a future humans or actually future non-humans coming but just and, and maybe even from the past coming and visiting obviously there is a, the, the 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 issue with a uh, time machine is it, it can't only be a time machine it has to also be um uh, an exemplary uh, craft to travel vast distances because we're always in a constant state of movement um i think you know we are on a rotating planet within a solar system that's and rotating around the sun the sun's rotating around uh, uh this local cluster etc the galaxy that we're in is rotating so we're going at at least a couple of hundred thousand miles an hour relative to maybe some fixed point that we we could we would arbitrarily set so you can't just say i'm gonna gonna go stay in the same place but just to a different time because that place has moved so these things you know are a little bit more complex of course we could have actual flying craft so i did say earlier quite tritely if not et then what but we could be seeing et or some other humanoid or not humanoid and we could there could be physical travel between um point a and point b um there's uh, for those of you who aren't aware um, i'm sure a lot of you will be the idea of the bending of space time so let's say a and b are vast distances apart and you want to go from one to the other one uh, one theory is that actually what you do you bring a and you bend space time such that a and b are, are closer together so when you're doing your traveling you're not actually having to 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 um go those distances one way of examining it is if you um you could have let's say if you get a piece of paper and you draw a and b on one side and you bring they you fold the paper and bring them together that's a good analogy what you could also do is put c on the other side which could be a different dimension and depending on how clever you are at origami you, you could you could travel all over different universes now, uh, lastly, even though the, the title of the talk, I'm, I'm almost finished now, the title of the talk had um, a portal in it. Really, a bit, this is just one way of, 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 of doing things. So I said that on one hand, you might just be observing something that you can't physically touch, but maybe that you can. And But we're not seeing them all the time. So if there are other realms, other dimensions, this idea of a vortex or a portal where um, entities or craft or both ourselves could travel through, whether naturally forming or intentionally created, um, could allow us to travel into these different realms, which rather suggests actually these realms aren't, aren't at all paranormal. They're just different versions of, of, of a reality um in potentially different places that we could get to what's interesting here and actually in some ways maybe the most in, you know one of the most important things is that if such portals and wormholes um do exist and maybe they can close up it, it can explain certain things that i'll go on to in, in, a, in a very very brief second but what i'm reading and when i in my research what i'm seeing more and more often is that individuals, people, are seeing phenomena across the paranormal spectrum, ghosts, UFOs, and to a lesser extent, cryptids. But more common, seeing particular places, are people are different people are observing um, phenomena across the paranormal spectrum, including cryptids. So it rather suggests that it could be that if something like a portal exists at one of these hot spots, for want of a better term, then then that's actually that can be quite significant because with the if you increase the number of of, of witnesses and there's some corroborating testimonies, then you can start to 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 chip away at what's what's really happening. Um. Okay, we've like really, really close to the end now. So 
given the nature of what we're talking about and that it's a very high level speculative just sort of a prod to get to get you know to to, to, to stimulate some thought and some discussion but to look at the interconnectedness or the potential interconnectedness of things just some things that i've not really been able to speak about um so many many historical and contemporary considerations that i've i've, I've not discussed um either i don't know or i don't know um if you have something like a portal um then there's aspects of scientific method which which when they seemingly broken down actually might be explained very speculatively there's a distinct lack of physical evidence of paranormal phenomena whether be they cryptids or ufos or or ghosts now there are there you know there are there are some but it's it's quite rare but if you imagine um imagine um a bigfoot or a chupacabra coming across a portal from one dimension, coming along, saying hello, scaring a few people, eating a few sheep, and going back. There's not that much time for this amount of physical evidence to to, to be left. I'm not saying that's what happens. Um, these things might not exist, of course. But it's just a thought. Again, within the scientific method, there's um, there's the issue of the repeatability of phenomena. And while there is some experimentation, and some of the phenomena I'm talking about, and some use of equipment, most things are spontaneous. So it, it's difficult to, to, to have all these things on hand. As I've already mentioned, if you have more than one witness or a number of measurements that are corroborating, that's also very good. Something that I've mentioned in a previous talk, but and I, and I mention it in a lot of different talks, actually, but I think it's quite important. I do have a physics background. And if you look at something like the, the discovery of the Higgs boson, which is incontrovertible, um, that experiment, the, the, the number of collisions was something like four and a half billion collisions that took place. Now, we can't go to four and a half billion haunted locations or the same place four and a half billion times very easily. Um, so it, there's, it, just to give you a flavour, the, the, the way we view science and some of the, the, the ways that science knocks back against paranormal phenomena, maybe we just need to uh, uh, expand our um definition of what science might need to look at maybe not certainly something that oliver lodge who one of the co-discoverers of um radio uh an early member of the spr thought i spoke about um this is looking at some of the cultural things i spoke about the u.s airship flap of the 1890s now the observations were with powered flight and propellers sometimes with definitely humans on board and sometimes without but this was before the wright brothers not very long before the light brothers you know 10 12 years or so but we're observing powered flight here so either if it's if the if it's these things weren't paranormal then it's just other people experimenting other humans experimenting and they just weren't as good uh, uh, you know at their self-promotion as the wright brothers were um, and so the, this technology was available. One could also say that it may be they were inherently um, almost cloaked or masked with um, with the with the look of the period. Um, so just something to think about. Again, now these are these are really brief because I haven't gone down the hole on these. Something to bear in mind: we looked at the the B, you know, the the, the stealth bombers compared and the triangle shape. It's conservatively estimated that the technology that is understood by you know the likes of Skunk Works and things now, especially in in aircraft technology, we won't we won't it won't be made public for twenty to fifty years, depending on what it is. So there's a lot of stuff out there that we're just not aware of. So we may be everything that we've I've spoken about today may be explicable by um, human technology and experimentation that we're just not privy to. Quite happy to accept that. If there are different realms, realms um, there might be different physics, but then you, that would suggest a different universe, not just a different realm. Um, this is just sheer difficulty of travelling 
you know, uh, physically from one realm to another. At my age, I have trouble traveling anywhere physically. Um, it may explain things like the seemingly impossible UFO maneuvers. Um, I, I encourage um, you to look at, you know, if you can look at some of the latest physics that's taking place and uh, the mathematics behind that, which is talking about uh, a multiple dimensions, teleportation, time travel, uh, much misused term quantum entanglement, but really interesting. All I'll say is that about this time last year, for the first time ever, uh, for those of you who are unaware of quantum entanglement, um, it's a concept where uh, a, a particle or particles are entangled through one of a number of different ways that they're connected they can be seemingly vast distances apart and if you affect one it has a, a physical effect on the other this is only ever, until about a year ago this was only ever observed at fundamental particle size um muons electrons etc but for the first time last year this has now gone to the next level up so still very much very small subatomic particles but not fundamental as we understand them. They're the next level up. So that's quite important. Okay. Um, last slide, just saying, I think we need, just need to continue to consider the cultural, sociological, historical, analytical, scientific uh, research on things. So data gathering, database of experiences, uh, take into account the contextual inputs that I was talking about, age, knowledge, pre-existing beliefs, geography, etc. Um, but also revisit um, existing reports, but in the light of things that maybe they weren't contextually looked at before. Um, and maybe update and cross reference the, the, the OCD part of me wants to update and cross-reference all the little diagrams um, that I showed you. Um, and that's, that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.